Hello scholars, this is Mr. Temez from Northern Oaks Athenaeum. And before we get to our next lesson and activity, I wanted to share with you a story that's going to challenge your ability to listen and to move. So you're gonna to need to be somewhere where you can move to your left and to your right. So take a second to get on your feet, get somewhere you can move. Now I'm gonna read a story called Captain Right and Lieutenant Left. When I say right, take a step to the right. When I say left, take a step to the left. Here we go. This is a story about two explorers, Captain Right and Lieutenant Left. One evening, the two explorers decided to go on a new expedition. Lieutenant Left checked their supplies. Oh no, he cried. There are plenty of food rations left we are missing our compass and our binoculars. You will need to go right out to the supply store and buy new ones. I can't believe you forgot to check our backpacks after our last trip, grumbled Captain Wright. You never get anything right. Don't be difficult, sir, replied Lieutenant Left. It will only take 20 minutes if you come right back. Go to 51st and Peoria and turn left at the stop sign. Then go to 61st Street and turn right, and there it will be on your left, declared Lieutenant Left. The captain left their base camp. Captain Wright found the store and asked the clerk where he could find the compasses. The clerk pointed and said, go to aisle four and turn left. The compasses will be on your left and binoculars will be on the right. Captain Wright made his purchase and walked right out the door. He turned left, but he couldn't remember where he had left his car. Suddenly, he remembered that he had driven Lieutenant Left's car and that his car was at the base right where he had left it. He finally found the right car and put his purchase right inside. Eventually, a weary Captain Wright found his way back to base. Lieutenant Left had been waiting impatiently. I thought you would be right back, he said. I left all the food rations out when it started to rain and ruined everything. You'll just have to go right out again. Captain Wright sighed. He had no energy left. I'm going right to bed, he said. You'll need plenty of rest if we are going exploring, so I might as well start right now. Isn't that right, Lieutenant Left? The end. How did you do? You can go back to the beginning of the video and play again, or maybe you can call a sibling or a parent or guardian to watch it with you and see how they do as well. Now, I hope you enjoyed it, and we have a great lesson and activity coming for you next. Have you ever been swept away by a story? I know I have. There are so many wonderful stories in the world to learn from and treasure. What is one of your favorite stories? What are you reading right now? Will you tell me in the comments below? Sometimes stories come to us by way of myths and legends from a long time ago. One of the most famous legends of all time is the story of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. These stories take place in medieval England during the times of knights and castles and fair maidens and noble lords and peasants. It all sounds quite wonderful, doesn't it? What a time of wonder and adventure to wrap our imaginations around. You have probably heard some of the stories of King Arthur before, but have you ever noticed that the best stories are the kind you can hear again and again and they never feel old? Today, I will share the tale of how Arthur removed the famous sword in the stone and took his place as the rightful king of England. In the days of old, Britain was ruled by King Uther Pendragon. The dragon was his emblem, and he was a mighty warrior and a great ruler. He was not only the greatest man in battle, but he was wise too, for he followed the counsel of Merlin, a great magician and seer. Merlin could cast magic spells and change shapes to look like an animal or another person. He was called a seer because he could see the future, for everyone, that is, except himself. 
Uther Pendragon had a son named Arthur. One day, when Arthur was still young, Merlin had a terrifying vision. He foresaw that Uther Pendragon would soon die from a plague that was sweeping the land. And he saw that, because Arthur was only a baby, many of the other noblemen would try to take his place as king. Some might even try to harm him, and war would break out. So, Merlin secretly gave Arthur into the care of a noble knight, Sir Ector, who did not know he was protecting the king's son and heir. Sir Ector raised Arthur along with his own son, Kay. Just as Merlin had predicted, Uther Pendragon died, and the British lords began to feud with each other over who should be king. For years, Britain was torn with warfare and strife. When Merlin felt that the time had come, he went to the Archbishop of Canterbury and said that if the Archbishop would call the lords of the land to London at Christmas, a miracle would reveal who was the rightful king of Britain. The Archbishop did as Merlin asked. On Christmas Day, all the lords attended church. When they came out, they found in the churchyard a square marble stone. In the middle of it was an anvil, and into the anvil was thrust a sword. The stone gripped the naked sword by the point, and on the blade was written in gold letters. Whosoever pulls out this sword from this stone and anvil is the true-born King of Britain. Each lord tried to pull the sword out, but all failed. News of the sword and the stone spread. A jousting tournament was announced for New Year's Day. The knights would first compete on the jousting field, then they would attempt to remove the sword. All the great lords attended a church service on New Year's Day. Among them were Sir Ector and his son, Sir Kay, who had only recently been made a knight. Arthur, only 15 years old and completely unaware of his kingly birth, acted as Kay's assistant or squire. After the church service, all rode in a merry company to the jousting field. When Sir Kay realized he had left his sword behind, he asked Arthur to ride back and get it for him. Arthur rode as fast as he could to their lodging, but found the door locked. Arthur had seen the sword in the stone, but did not know of the legend surrounding it. He said to himself, I will ride to the churchyard and take that sword in the stone, for my brother shall not be without a sword this day. Arthur was alone at the churchyard, for everyone else was at the jousting tournament. He grasped the sword by the hilt and gave it a light, quick pull. Out it came. Arthur jumped onto his horse, rode to the jousting field, and gave Kay the sword. Now, being a knight, Kay had been told the meaning of the sword in the stone. He recognized at once what it might mean to see Arthur grasping the sword before him. Unwisely, he tried to deceive his father, saying, Sir, look, here is a sword of the stone, so I must be the king of this land. Sir Ector was amazed. He took Kay and Arthur back to the churchyard and asked Kay to swear how he came by the sword. Frightened, Kay now admitted, Sir, my brother Arthur brought it to me. Then Kay and his father looked at young Arthur. Sir Ector remembered how Merlin had brought Arthur to see him in secret many years earlier. Merlin had told him he was to bring the boy up as his own. In time, he would learn who the child truly was. How did you get the sword? Sir Ector asked Arthur. Arthur told him exactly what he had done. Now, said Sir Ector to Arthur, you must be king of this land. I? said Arthur, astonished. How can that be? No man could have pulled out this sword unless he was the rightful king of this land, said Sir Ector. Now let me see whether you can put the sword back as it was and pull it out again. That is quite easy, said Arthur. There in the frosty churchyard stood the white stone with the anvil, but with no sword in the anvil. Arthur thrust the sword back into the anvil, which held the blade snugly. To see that there was no trick, 
Sir Ector tried to pull it out. He could not move it at all. Now you try, he said to Sir Kay, who pulled with all his might but could not move it. Now you, Sir Ector said to Arthur. Very well, said Arthur, and he pulled it out easily. Sir Ector and Sir Kay knelt down before Arthur. My own dear father and brother, cried the boy nervously. Why do you kneel down before me? Then Sir Ector told Arthur that he was not really his son, and that Merlin had brought him as a baby to be raised in his household. Sir, said Sir Ector, I will ask no more of you that you make my son, your foster brother, Sir Kay, steward in charge of your lands. That shall be done, answered Arthur, and no other man shall have the office while he and I live. The three men went to the archbishop to tell what had happened. Arthur took the sword in both hands and laid it on the altar where the archbishop was standing. Then he knelt down, and the grandest knight present stepped forward to make Arthur a knight. The archbishop set the crown of Britain on Arthur's head, and Arthur swore to treat all, high and low, with justice all the days of his life. King Arthur became a legend all throughout England, and the world and people, like us, still think about him today and wonder what it must have been like to be the boy who pulled the sword from the stone and became king. I want to challenge your imagination, using only things you can find in your house and backyard, and with your parents' or guardians' permission, of course. Fashion your own sword in the stone and send me a picture. What will you use for a stone? I can't wait to see where your imagination leads you. Thank you for sharing this time with me today. Goodbye for now.